Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher, and today we are celebrating episode 100 of the Inspire Campfire podcast. It has been such an amazing experience to have conversations with so many people and their extraordinary adventures. And today is no exception, as we are joined by the podcast's producer, Mr. Ryan Dean, who has been behind the scenes this whole time and the first person to hear each and every episode. Ryan is not only the podcast producer, but he's also a creator, an entrepreneur, and an adventurer. He's the inventor of the Peacekeeper, a self-defense aid that uses your standard house key, and we'll get into that later in the show today. In the time I've been working with Ryan to share these 100 podcast episodes, Ryan has also been working on converting a school bus into an RV a unique combination also known as a schoolie. When we first met, he was just getting started. And earlier this year, Ryan and his fiance Beatrice finished the bus and they're now living and working full time on it. I've been waiting a long time for Ryan to share the story of making a schoolie. And for this 100th episode, that's exactly what we're going to do. Ryan, welcome to the campfire. Thanks for having me, Scott. Congrats on 100. It's a a big feat. Yeah, man. It's something that, uh, that we can celebrate together. I'm super excited and uh, just so grateful for everything that you've done to to help share these stories. It's been so much fun. But today, it's about you and your story, man. Yeah, I'm excited to share. Yeah. So time. I know. So let, I, let's just jump right in and, and um, tell us, uh, how, do you, how do you acquire a school bus and what is a schoolie? Yeah, so a schoolie is uh, a school bus, you know, that carries kids most of the time, and it's uh, where you convert it into a living space. So ours is a 30-foot uh, 2003 Bluebird. Um, it, it's their standard school bus when I got it. It was nice and yellow. It just come with seats in it, and you have to take them all apart. But uh, yeah, so we converted it to a living space, uh, my fiance and I. We have, you know, queen-size bed. We have running water, uh, flushing toilet shower hot water which is important full kitchen space wi-fi on the road um it's nice normally i'm in there but uh, i'm actually staying at a, a family member's right now so uh it, that, it gives you flexibility which is fantastic i love it well you're still outside and that's and that's a lot of fun so um what is the major difference between like just your standard rv and a converted school bus yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. And I get that question a lot. Like, why not just buy an RV? Like, why yeah. do you go through all this extra work to just do the same thing, essentially? I mean, it comes down to a couple of things. Price is a big one. Uh, RVs for a comparable size. And, you know, uh, when you see the pictures, when I share them, uh, you can tell the difference. Like, a lot of RVs are very uh, standard on the inside. And, yeah. you know, for the price you get, if you want luxury, you have to spend a lot of money on it. So the nice thing about a schoolie is you can really customize it and make it unique so each one you know if you see they're not going to be the same they might have similar uh you know styles to them but each one's unique to the person and uh i mean really a big thing is, is the community behind it too uh i can go on the road and if i see another schoolie we're instantly connecting we're instantly like best friends you know where are you going next uh, do you have a place to stay are you, you know what's your plan are you doing this full time what do you do like it's just fun to interact with those types of people and I mean, another thing you don't get from an RV as well is if you pull up an RV and you see an RV on the road, but if you pull up to a gas station, most of the time you're not going to stop and talk to the person who has an RV and be like, can I get a tour? But almost every time we stop at a gas station, it's no surprise when someone comes and knocks on our door and they're saying, hey, like, this is so cool. Like, is this is this a schoolie? Is this a school? Like, you guys live in this? We're yeah. Like, yeah. And they're like, can we have a tour? And we're like, sure. Yeah, of course. So, um We've definitely gotten used to it on the road, and uh, it's definitely normal. We we tell people about it, and they're like, "Wait, people just come up to you and ask to come inside your 
you know, your your school bus. Like, yeah, like to us, it's normal, but to some people, it's like it's, it's kind of a shock. I mean, it's almost a little creepy. Like, hey, come on inside my school bus. No, but yours is yeah. so awesome. It's so inviting. Yeah, and we, you know, we've been to like Bucky's. I'm not sure if you know that big yeah. uh-huh. gas station. We were out uh, in Florida and we were driving through. We had someone follow behind us. We were pumping gas. And all of a sudden, there's just like a Jeep behind us. And I'm like, hey, you got to go around. Like, we're taking up the whole spot. Like, we have to fill up gas. Um, sorry, we're taking up the whole. And he's like, no, like, we want to. My daughter wants to have a tour of your bus. That's okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it, it's fun. It, it's okay. different fun. That's so cool. So that's the thing is that a schoolie has a story because they they're you know it's it's your own. It's got its own character. Exactly, and it's a cool thing. Like being on the road, we have our you know our social media handles on the side, uh, seats taken, bus, and we get so many messages. Um, so in good times and bad, like if anything happens on the road, if we pull over, even on the side, someone will be like, "Hey, is everything okay?" Or "Hey, just passed you," and they'll tell you what city and state they're in. So that's kind of cool to look back on just past you and you know alabama uh god bless uh safe travels and you know i feel like you don't get that in an rv or anywhere else yeah totally well you know i have i have intentionally not asked you a bunch about the bus in the couple of years that we've known each other because we've talked about doing this episode from the very beginning but i know you wanted to kind of get through the process of the conversion to be able to tell the whole story um which is cool so i'm going to be learning a lot as we go here what inspired you to do this in the first place where'd you get the idea yeah, so a while back, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, there's a Netflix documentary called Expedition Happiness. And it was actually uh, a couple from Germany, and they bought a school bus, I believe in Canada, converted it in a, a lot faster time than we did. I think it was like 30 to 60 days. Um, they didn't have all the bells and whistles, but it was still very livable, very nice. And they went you know, from Canada, I think they went to the U.S. some, uh, you know, all the way up to Alaska, um, even down, I think, the West Coast and into Mexico. And just seeing that journey and saying, oh, wow, this is an option. Um, you know, at the time I was living in San Diego with three roommates, paying a ridiculous amount of money in a tiny closet, essentially. And then, you know, you kind of have that in the back of your head, like, why am I paying to stay in this tiny space? Like, the area is nice, but yeah. that's the dream, right? Like, oh, if I could get up and go and have a different scene, you know, every day if I want to. Uh, have a different area to explore like why not so that kind of stayed with me for a while um it wasn't until right before the pandemic you know i was was always you know friends in california and stuff were always saying oh yeah you know i'm gonna do that too that sounds like fun um but it wasn't until uh, 2019 right before the pandemic happened that my grandpa actually got sick and passed away Mm. and that was kind of a turning point for me um you know it was right before covid and all that happened so luckily we got a chance to actually, you know, be with him when he passed, mm. but that kind of just hit me. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, if I'm going to do this, I got to do it now. Like it's, it's kind of funny how loss will you know, be a catalyst for change and just like get you moving. So right, like literally, you know, right after the funeral, I was like, I'm going to buy a bus. And I started looking and uh, started researching it hardcore. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, so do you remember that the, like, exact moment when you said like i'm doing this and like you were ready to pull the trigger yeah yeah the exact moment was when my grandpa passed and that's when i was like i'm gonna do this uh i'm gonna look for a bus and i did a lot of research and i had a specific bus in mind i didn't necessarily just jump in not knowing and just buying a random bus um so i i did a lot of research on it Uh, and luckily you know with the schoolie community there is a lot of resources online And uh, from the get-go, you know, people in the planning stages to people who are, you know, selling their bus to people who are, you know, redesigning it because, you know, things happen. Some people change their lifestyle. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, you know, I think that what's so cool about this story is like you you already said, like you could have gone out and just bought an RV, but you did this schoolie so that you could make it your own. So like part of this story is not just like jumping in a van and going off and, you know, living on the road. I mean, you've been working. This has been like a really almost a two year project for you. So I really am curious about the whole process of this. Like, first of all, where do you even begin to look for a schoolie and who do you buy a schoolie from? Yeah, so um, people do it a couple different ways. 
some people go to auctions and that's what uh, a lot of people do. You know, they'll research like the states that, you know, it's it's uh, favorable conditions and like, you know, the, a lot of school districts will be letting go a fleet of buses and people will be like, go here and buy, you know, uh, a bus and you can get them for maybe 1500 to 2000 I kind of went a little different route, um, just kind of my planning ahead and I wanted a certain type of bus, uh, you know, like I said, it's a 2003 Bluebird, um, TC2000. Um, it's a certain style. It's front engine, not rear engine. Um, that's a big thing kind of when it comes to where you can park it. Some RV parks in some places won't allow you to come in if you look like a school bus. So I wanted to make mine look as much as like an RV as possible. Um, you know, kind of clean it up. And, you know, some people do their own things because they'll never want to stay in an RV park. But I was kind of planning ahead. Uh, another thing was, you know, 30 feet, a lot of state parks don't accommodate anything bigger than 30 feet, regardless mm, if you're a school okay. bus or an RV. So I definitely did some homework <laughs> ahead of time because I didn't want to miss out on some opportunities. Yeah. Um, so I want to stop yeah, you. I, I'm going to, it's going to yeah. maybe be a naive question, but national parks na or parks, they don't want plate the rvs that look like school buses what's what's that about a uh, state parks and national parks you know definitely they allow it um okay. but it's more rv parks so you know okay. you get to a, K a koa sometimes it depends each one's different you know you just have to be prepared to get turned away um so that's kind of just you know something to walk into you can't expect oh there's this beautiful rv park that has these half million dollar rvs and they're just gonna allow us to come in gotcha. so there's, there's some politics to it Okay. But uh, it, it's not, yeah, it's not too bad. There's never been anyone who's been like, you know, oh, that's an ugly bus. It's more so like at this time we have a 10 year rule. So anything older than 10 years can't come. And that's it. pretty typical for RV parks in the ways. Yeah. Not yours. Yours is pretty. Yeah. Ours is pretty. We made yeah. sure of that. <laughs> so, yeah, but, so uh, you yeah. Were, yeah. You were talking about how you acquired it. Yep. So uh, instead of going to an auction, we decided to actually go to a bus dealer out in uh, Seattle, Washington. Cause like I said, we were looking for a specific bus and everyone was saying, oh, you can get one around here. You know, we're based in Virginia. They're like, you can get one around here. I was like, no, like the one I'm looking for is very specific. Like I can only, I only found one in like Seattle, Washington, low miles. Uh, that's another factor. So uh, yeah, we went to this bus place in uh, it's Northwest bus sales. Shout out to them. They're great guys. Um, paid a little bit more than what most people do on, you know, a school bus, I'm sure, yep. you know, at auctions, but we knew where it's been. I, when I bought it, I had a stack of folders, you know, this high of just everything that's ever been done on it, which was great. You don't always get that. Um, and yeah, so we went and picked it up and that was, you know, that was a adventure in itself. Yeah, totally. So for listeners, um, at that time you were living in Virginia beach area. So, yep, beach. so you have to get this thing from Seattle now to Virginia beach. Yep. So we, uh, we flew out there at the time, uh, Beatrice and I weren't together. Uh, we were friends, but you know, she wasn't necessarily a part of this life yet. Um, that's a, that's a whole nother topic, but uh, I actually went out with my sister uh, to uh, this bus dealer. We flew across the country with one of her friends and uh, she helped me drive it back. Cause it was, you know, it's a big undertaking. And again, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. This was uh, I think May. So pretty early on in the pandemic. Um, so we flew out there. Um, everything was scheduled to pick it up, never drove anything that big before. So it was definitely a shock. And actually the, uh, the salesman, he, you know, he gave us the keys. He drove us around actually, then actually at a stoplight, he just kind of stopped, put it in park and said, here you go. You jump in. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so we we're in Seattle and I'm like, this is not like a small right. know, or like a, you know, a big area where we could just, you know, have lots of room to maneuver. Um, so it was definitely like, you know, trial by fire, just get yeah. in the, the hot seat. Um, but it was fine. Um, you know, we, we traveled around. Uh, we took a little bit of time. We went down to the Redwoods because while we were out there, we're like, let's enjoy it. Let's see what this thing can do. And so that was fun. You know, we had the seats taken out already. Um, just had like a little bed in the back, a little uh, Coleman cooker. And yeah, that was, that was a fun time for sure. Did it have like all the, the seats and everything in it at that time when you bought it? No, the seats. So I paid a little bit extra um, because these guys dealt with, people who were converting and they're like, okay. Hey, for like, I think it was like an extra 700 bucks. So like, we'll take the seats out for you. Gotcha. So they left a row for us. So it wasn't completely empty, but it was still, that was a lot of work that they saved us with that. Um, that was great. 
Yeah. So, and then again, just to clarify, so it's a 30 foot bus and you don't need any kind of special license to drive it. Nope. As long as the seats are out and it's, uh, it's classified and titled as a motor home, you're, you don't need a CDL. You don't need a special license. Yeah, so that's, awesome. that's a process to, um, getting that titled, but, um, wasn't too bad. Yeah. So tell us about the trip back. Like, I mean, this is your first trip in the, in the bus and it's not even converted yet, but, uh, you got to get it back to the, to the East coast. Yeah. So it was, it was good to see how it ran and just, you know, even before I bought the bus, I had an idea of how I want to lay it out, but being in the bus and actually seeing like, Hey, there's nothing in here. Like what, you know, when you see a bus and you see this open space, I mean, it's 200 square feet. <laughs> so you're thinking like, what can I put in here? What, you know, what can I actually make with this? Like, Oh, I want a bathroom. How big can that bathroom actually be without, mm -hmm. you know, making your kitchen super small. Um, so it was good to be in it and actually see like, Oh, like I would like this. I would like that. I don't necessarily need uh, something else. Um, but yeah, it, it was a fun time. Like I said, uh, we didn't have seats. <laughs> so we were kind of just taking turns driving, rolling around. Um, so that was definitely interesting. But yeah, just the fact that we got to go down um, the Oregon Coast Highway. Uh, I, I believe it's the 101. We got to go yeah. down there and just, yeah. you know, see all of that and just get a glimpse of it. Um, then down to the Redwoods. We spent a night around there. You know, we, we cooked breakfast on our little uh, camper cooker. And uh, yeah, it's great. Went through I don't know, Nevada, went through a couple places. I think it was one night we actually stopped at an Airbnb because we were getting on each other's nerves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, this is not like three people on the bus right now um, with nothing in it. It's kind of you know crazy. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was definitely a good introduction. Um, yeah, made it all the way across and it was a, a good test run. Yeah. Any trouble on the way on the way back? No, uh, nothing mechanical. Uh, like I said, just butting heads a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then we did go through a tornado uh, watch. So that was kind of uh, we're like, oh, gosh, let's get out of here. Um, which the nice thing is you can just stroll through and it wasn't a big deal. But yeah, nothing, nothing uh, bad happened on that trip. So that was good. So at this point, it's a big old yellow school bus. And it's just got no yep. seats in it. So you're driving along and it's just completely empty. We, did, were you guys sleeping in it at night? Yeah, we were sleeping in that night. Uh, the the dealer, they made us like a little twin size bed and threw a little twin size mattress in it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and that was it. So, yeah, some of us were, you know, we went to Walmart before and we, you know, got some supplies, some sleeping bags and some fold up chairs that we had in it. But, yeah, it was it was bare bones. Uh, nothing in it. Yeah. So I'm really curious, like, like when he handed you the keys and said, like, here you go, was there any like buyer's remorse or any like fear or like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? No, not really. Um, the big thing, I mean, there's a little bit of, I guess, general fear of just getting it back. I'm like, I'm on the other side of the country. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just bought a bus. If anything goes wrong with it, like, oh, that's going to be some trouble getting it back, getting it fixed. I have no idea how much that's going to cost. So, uh, but as far as like, the, the journey ahead, you know, I'm the type of person who, when I kind of have an idea, um, I like to map it out in my head and I like to see the end result. And I just keep thinking of that end result and that kind of gets through, you know, most of the fear, but you know, like with anything, uh, there's going to be some general fear. And when you hit some certain points, like, Oh, we're hitting the road now. Like, okay. It's a little bit, we're in the city still. Like there's some general fear, but nothing that was like, Oh, I'm returning the bus. I can't do this. Yeah. I love it. All right. So you get all the way back across the country and, uh, you know, you've got, you've got a project ahead. Where do you keep the bus when you're work, like, as you're kind of working on it? Yeah. So we had a, a family property actually. Yeah. It was my grandma's old place. And, um, so luckily we, we were able to put it there and work on it. There's plenty of room for it. So that was a blessing because yeah, that's, uh, generally a, a problem that some people have like, Oh, I'd love to do this, but I have no place to actually house a 30 foot bus, especially when there's neighbors and stuff. You don't want to, yeah, totally. you know, this it's kind of an eyesore, right. but uh, yeah, so we, we were able to work on it there. And, um, yeah. And so you mentioned like you're a planner. So I'm like, I'm really curious how much of this whole thing you had planned out in terms of what you were going to do to it, who was going to work on it. Like, I'm re I really want to get into like, what did you do versus what did you hire out? Yeah, for sure. And like I said, like, even before I got the bus, I knew the dimensions. I even had the dealer, like they were across the country. They, you know, sent me dimensions. They're like, Hey, this is how far it is to the seat. This is how wide it is. This is where the wheel wells are. Just so I had an idea. And then I actually 
mapped it out in my uh, parents' backyard. I like mapped it out with stakes and nice. I knew this is the size it's going to be. So there's definitely some planning like that. And then, you know, there's a certain order you have to go in just like, you know, you're building a house. You have to start yes. with the foundation. Um, is there rust? Cause once you pull, you know, you don't know if there's anything under, um, you know, the plywood that you pull up, there's like rubber on top. It's, you know, been used as a school bus for mm -hmm. 20 years. So you don't know what's under there. So that's the first step. Um, just going through that, making sure there's no rust that there is fixing it. Um, there's, you know, solvents you can use and then grinding it out, uh, patching it all up. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely followed, there's a lot of resources online with fellow schoolie um, community where they'd say, Hey, this is the best order. Like, you know, you have to do your insulation, you have to do your framing. Um, don't touch the electrical till your framing is done. Um, all that. So, uh, definitely followed as much as I could of what most people were doing. And, you know, even finding people who had a similar style bus as me, Hey, I loved what you did with that bathroom. What size is it? Like, and you know, these are most things like if someone messaged you, you'd be like, what are they talking about? But schooly people, they are like, Oh yeah, I use this exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. It cost me this much money. Yeah. Um, you know, good luck on your bill. If you have any questions, give me a call. So that was nice. Um, but then finding, you know, help throughout, I had a shout out to my buddy, Chris Beecham. He was huge. He actually works at the shipyard around here. He helped me weld uh, a lot of the water tanks under the bus. Cause again, those are things, there's certain items. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this on my own. And I'm not going to be able to pick up that skill where it's going to be worth it. So there are things I already knew I was going to outsource. I just didn't know how much it was going to cost. Um, and luckily I found some people that I knew who, you know, were great resources to help me. Yeah. Um, but I would say roughly about 50% I did on my, uh, on my own, maybe 40% um, and 60% with help. Yeah. And so like, all right, you know, I'm, I have my day job in, in real estate, right? So I understand how houses get built. Like this is a, mm -hmm. this is a renovation, but you know, you're taking the, the structure of a, of a bus of a vehicle, and then you're adding all these things that don't typically belong on a bus. Like what are some of the things like just for listeners, get our minds going, you know, plumbing electrical, like what are some of the things that you've got to do to turn this thing into an RV? Yeah. Um, one of the biggest challenges was making things level. I mean, or at least even because mm -hmm. <laughs> a bus, it's not, you know, especially if you don't have it on a flat surface when you're working on it, that was mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges. Wow, so yeah. framing, framing it out still, I mean, there's little tricks you can do and um, you, you know, you've been in the bus and it looks even, but there's, you know, if you take a, you know, a leveling tool or um, anything, it's, you're going to see it's uneven, but uh, that was a big thing. Just the foundation's key. Like you don't want to skip ahead. That's, like for me, I took my time. I'm like, I'm not going to rush by. And if there's any rust, I'm not going to rush by if the framing's not done right. Um, or if I need to change something, I'm going to take my time and do it the right way. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, we have 2,400 watts of solar on it. Um, that's something we wanted uh, to be fully off grid. Um, you know, we have a basically a, a full size refrigerator inside with a freezer. Um, so we have to make sure we have the power figured out so it could accommodate that uh, an AC unit. Um, you know, running water for the kitchen, we have a stove and the, you know, cooktop. Uh, so there's a lot of things, and, you know, queen size bed. And we wanted to make sure to maximize that. Like I didn't want to have a full size or anything smaller. So, uh, we definitely put a lot of thought into a, we're going to live in this thing. What's going to be nice where you can wake up every day and enjoy it. And you're not going to feel like I'm living in a, a bus. I'm living, yeah. you know, because there's some people who, you know, more power to them. They'll just buy the bus and then basically throw a sofa in there, throw a bed in there and call it a day. And I'm like, that's, that's not what we're trying to do. We're right. trying to, <laughs> trying to make it livable for a, a long time where we can enjoy it. Right. And so, so you say you have a solar panel on top. Is that, uh, is that enough to power the whole thing when the bus isn't turned on? Yeah, that's, that's enough to power it for, it really depends if it's a cloudy day, it's gonna, you know, definitely drain faster because it's not pulling in any power. It can do probably four to six hours. Um, but if it's a sunny day, it stores it up nicely. And again, we have a very, you know, uh, I guess heavy duty AC unit on top. That's yeah. one of the bigger draws. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something that pulls a lot of our energy. But uh, yeah, we just upgraded that recently. So um, it, it's it's performing well. Yeah. So, you know, Ryan, I know you're somebody that's, you've got kind of an engineer's creatives mind. Like you're, you're a very handy person. I'm curious, like, did you have to acquire like any specialized tools for the stuff that you did? For sure. Uh, 
the painting that was one big thing that's something i did on my end uh a lot of people just roll it i was like i don't want to roll it i want to spray it and mm -hmm. i had no idea how to spray the the bus um so i had to buy you know um some special tools for that and uh definitely take you know watch some youtube videos um so yeah there are definitely tools along the way um and you know with the painting that was a big thing like it's i had to tell myself it was kind of that barrier of like it's not a ferrari it's not a, a sports car like it is a bus yeah like it took me so long to actually make the first spray because i'm like oh what if it messes up what if it yeah. bubbles you know <laughs> I, i'm not a professional um because you know i was getting quotes for like ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars just for the paint job i was like no way yeah. so uh we did it for about a thousand with all the materials all the paint ourselves um but yeah there's definitely you know tools uh but luckily you know my family you know i have my brother who helps some um, he had some tools, you know, saws with the, the demolition of, you know, taking out the rivets. That's a big part of it. And just cleaning it all up, grinding everything. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of tools yeah. to buy. But And then for the stuff that you outsourced, um, you, you know, are there, is it easy to find people that do this kind of work? That was a challenge because there are certain parts, especially with the electrical, that was kind of a, that's why I think it kind of took longer with the process. Yeah. It would have probably been done six months if it wasn't for the electrical. Since I, there's so many things, you know, we have the solar, we have shore power. So when we go to a campground, we can plug in or we can go, you know, to a family member's house, we can plug in when we're on the road. If we don't have access to the sun, you know, we can um, still generate everything. So finding specific people, you know, I call the local electrician. I tell them the project like, hey, I have a, a school bus I'm converting. I don't know if you guys work on that type of stuff. Um, so I had some people come through, but they didn't specialize in it, which made it tough. They're like we can try, but it's like, I, you know, that was one of those things I didn't want to mess up was the electrical. It's like, I don't want to ever have to worry about something yeah. catching fire on the road. Um, so I, I actually got connected by a mutual friend um daniel and he was a huge help in the process he did a lot of the finishing off of everything the plumbing and electrical he was a godsend um but he was out in missouri so that was actually an interesting story of driving out there with a half completed bus <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i it's just so much fun like this this whole thing and you know it's a big thing like on instagram right now especially if you like follow this sort of world there's all kinds of yeah. different instagram channels that are showing people doing these conversions but yours is this is like this is real it's not this isn't just yeah. like social media life like this is something that you can do and I, I i feel like um you know the the vision was to live and work full time on a bus but i suspect that part of this for you was just the fun of actually doing the project yourself for sure and that's something i've been reflecting on recently too i'm um, just like it was a lot of fun and i saw other people say the same thing when they're done with their build they're like i want to go build another I mean, i don't know if i'd necessarily go back and do another right away but i'm like yeah it, it was fun um the process just you know you go in there you go and just be like, all right this is what i'm going to tackle today and then you'd see if you could actually tackle it without running into another problem um it, it was a lot of fun to do and just you know you're while you're working in it you're thinking where can i take this thing oh i'm going to go to the beach i'm going to go to california i'm going to be able to pull up to the beach and just enjoy you know the view the sunset whatever um it's going to be a blast i can work from the road i'll have no mortgage uh just a lot of freedom there was kind of the the end result with the goal yeah so i mean let's go there is is all that coming true for you now yeah i mean it's definitely while we were working on the the bus you know i got a place in virginia beach we rented and while we were still working on it so it's like oh but all we could think about was the bus like oh yeah. we're not gonna have to pay rent anymore hey we're not gonna have to go get a house and do a mortgage like we want to see more of the country um so i think it definitely it's, it's shown us a lot um we haven't gone to as many places as we wanted to yet. Uh, just with, you know, some situations with the car that we have our little our, uh, smart car, but yeah, I mean, it's been great. Uh, we've been houseless for what, since February, not homeless. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, you know, we've been able to live without um, necessarily a, a house roof over our head, um, which has been interesting and to show that we can you know, actually live in such a small space and we don't have to rely on, Oh, we don't need this only a four bedroom house, you know, right now, maybe some time along, you know, in the future, but right now let's just see more of the country that we haven't seen, see where we want to settle down and go from there. 
Yeah. So um, just to kind of bring listeners in here, you you kind of alluded to this, but um, you were recently engaged. Yep. But you said that when this whole process started, she wasn't involved in this whole process of acquiring the bus. So yeah, she came on after you'd already acquired the bus and you know, she's, she's buying into this lifestyle. I'd say that, I'd say that's a a pretty big win. Yeah, for sure. Uh, she didn't necessarily choose this life, but the bus life chose her. (laughs) I definitely say, um, I mean, but it was great because she was, you know, we talked about before we, you know, started dating because, you know, we started dating right in the middle of this, uh, conversion. And at the time, you know, I'm, when I'm building this, I'm thinking I'm a, I'm a bachelor. All I have is my dog. I'm going to hit the road and, you know, I'm going to have this, this beach home on wheels. So uh, that definitely played a factor into the design process and just what we were going to do with everything. Um, but no, she, she had some definitely with what you see in the bus, they just had some great input and uh, it wouldn't be what it is without that, with her input. So fun. And so, you know, as you said, you guys have been not homeless, but houseless for mm-hmm. four or five months. What are, what are some of the things you guys have gotten to do so far with the bus? Yeah. So initially, um, you know, we've gone up to Maryland where her family is. Mm-hmm. We've gotten to go, you know, throughout the South, Southeast mostly because we're based in Virginia. So, you know, we've gone to Tennessee. That's actually where we got some work done on the bus for uh, more of the solar. So that was a, a trip. And then, you know, we just stayed on the road, went to Alabama, uh, went to Florida for a while, which was nice. Um, you know, just Tennessee, South Carolina. Yeah, really just the the Southeast is where we've been so far. Um, so we were actually on our way to California, uh, about a month or two ago when we had some issues on the road, but we were planning to visit more of the, the West coast with the bus. Cause that's kind of the, the dream with it. Yeah. To get back out there to the San Diego area. Mm-hmm. That sounds fun. Show, yep. show off the bus, man, out there. It's going to be, that's going to be so awesome. Um, yeah. so are there, when you were in the build process, do you have any, were there any sort of lessons learned, anything that you would do differently? Yeah, there's not too much I do differently. Um, like I said, we did a lot of planning ahead of time on what we wanted. Um, I would say maybe move a little faster, not be such perfectionist about things. Uh, like you know, the, I kind of I'm envious of those people who just buy the bus and then put stuff in it and hit the road. So that's one of those things where it's like you know, do you want the experience or do you want you know the luxury? <laughs> and uh, I would have definitely hit the road sooner, you know, maybe not worried about if the sofa pulls out a certain way Mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's this color, um, I might just put a stove in there, moved a little bit faster on it. Um, That might be the only thing I would say is just, you know, see what's important. If you want to see the country, get out there um, and see it as quickly as possible. I love it. All right. So I know one of the questions that a lot of people will have, and I'm sure you've gotten this too, is like, you know, how do you create this life for yourself where you get to live and work on a bus? What What is that like for you? Yeah, so the, the great thing is uh, Beatrice and I are both remote. So with most of our, our jobs, you know, with her job and most of my ventures, it's remote. So, you know, uh, working on the podcast with you has been fantastic. Um, you know, I have a couple other clients I work with, you know, with freelance. And then I actually have a company called Peacekeeper. Mm-hmm. I invented a product a few years back, uh, a self-defense aid. And so that's another um, you know, source of income on the road, which has been nice. Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, let's go ahead and just talk about that right now, because that's a very cool product that, that you invented. Um, tell us about that real quick. Yeah. So uh, Peacekeeper, it's a, a self-defense aid and it's a practical one. It uses your standard house key. So actually, when I was living in uh, the D.C. area in my mid-20s, I was walking home from uh, you know work. I worked in real estate, actually, um, as a head transaction coordinator. You know, I had the suit and tie. I had my briefcase and I had my car keys and my house key. That was it. Um, I felt someone behind me. And, you know, to this day, I still don't know if there's someone was behind me or not. But I, you know, the instinct was grab my keys, put it between my fingers. And if I had to use it, I would use it to defend myself. Um, Luckily, I got to my apartment and there was you know, no issues. No one was behind me or if they were, they disappeared. Um, But immediately I went and I, I Googled, can I use my house keys to defend myself? Is it effective? And uh, the results were, you know, mixed. They said, yes, you can, if you absolutely have to. But the other side was saying, don't do it because you'll end up hurting yourself more. You'll actually uh, mess up your hands and it can get you know damaged. 
uh, open up blood veins, all that stuff. So um, I was like, wow, what if there's a way that I can actually make a, a holder of some sort where I can have a little bit more reach, protect my hand um, and use your house key. And it's just something practical that you can have on you all the time. You know, pepper spray, mace, all that stuff is great if it, you know you can use it. But, you know, there's certain age groups, there's certain places where it's not allowed. And um, it's just something, you know, like I said, when I was working in real estate, I didn't think, oh, I should carry a gun or a knife. I, I just have my house keys. So, um, yeah, a practical tool that you know, anyone can can carry. Yeah. And it's great. I've got one. It's, uh, you know, very like ergonomically it's easy to hold on to. Yeah. And it's really it's a really creative uh, device that you've come up with. And it, and it speaks to who you are. Right. You invented the peacekeeper. You are somebody that not only wants to live and work on the road, but you decided you're going to like find a bus and you're going to convert it. You're going to work on it. You, you like to use your mind. You like to use your hands. And so I'm curious, like where that uh, adventure and entrepreneur spirit came from and they're like, are they the same or are they, are they different? That's a good question. Um, definitely. I mean, I feel like it comes from the business side. You know, I grew up around the family business. Mm -hmm. um, my, my family did flooring. So growing up around that, you just kind of pick up on things. And I felt like I had a little bit more room than most people to explore. Um, you know, I didn't have to do this, you know, go to school, go to college, you know, do follow this path. You have to do this. It's more, hey, if you want to do this, try it out. Um, you know, a business, uh, especially a family business, you know, if, if something's wrong and can be improved, you know, you're expected to speak up. <laughs> you know, just because it affects the family. It just doesn't yeah. affect, you know, the company. Um, so definitely having that uh, opportunity and, and that family environment helped for sure. Yeah. So you've always had like a degree of freedom in your professional life? I Yeah, for the most part. I mean, you know, I definitely working in real estate, not always, you know, I've had, I've worked for, you know, a couple companies before. Um but yeah, I definitely chose, uh, you know, being your own boss. That's that's kind of the dream. Being on the road, working for yourself. If you know you can, if you can do that, yeah, that's what I love to do. Yeah, man, it's so awesome. And you know, you just like you're somebody that's always got uh, a handful of different projects going on. And you know that you you are definitely the epitome of an entrepreneur. It's just so cool to watch. And so you know, one of your other ventures has been. Uh, working on this podcast with me, which has been so fun. And, you know, here we are a hundred episodes in almost two years in, it's been a lot of fun. Wild. Yeah. Yes. And I'm just curious, like how has, so for you, you're the, you're literally the first person to hear every single episode because you're listening yep. to them, you're doing some editing to, you know, fine tune things. And so I'm curious, like, as you listen to people's stories of adventure, like what's been, what's been most inspiring for you? Yeah. I mean, it's been fantastic. I mean, every week there's, it's like inspiration and it's not necessarily work. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, I'm getting paid to do it, but it's like, man, it's, it's definitely changed my lifestyle. Um, you know, even, you know, with the bus it was, it was motivation, like get the bus done faster so you can go explore what these other people are doing. Yeah. You know, there are so many great stories. Um, so it's definitely motivating, uh, you know, different types of people, different backgrounds, you know, different abilities and just, you know, I've had some friends on the podcast and, you know, hearing their stories, and, you know, we've known each other for years and they've never even mentioned half the stuff that they, you know, yeah. talk to you about. I'm like, man, you're my friend. That's awesome. You've done this. That's so cool. Um, so it's definitely inspirational to just see what everyone's doing um, and having, you know, different backgrounds, different careers, and they're still making it work. Yeah, totally. Are there a um, couple different episodes that stand out as some of your favorites? Yeah, there. I was looking back. I mean, there's so many, and there, so many different ones that are great. It's hard to, you know, just name a couple. But I mean, recently, like Sophie's was one of the recent ones that yeah. had some top of my mind. Like her background, all the things she's done. It's just like back to back to back, like amazing things. It's like, what am I doing? I got to get out there and do more <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, Karen Dark. I mean, all her incredible stories. She's been on a couple times, and just you know, she keeps going back. It's not like, hey, one and done. You know she goes out and goes for more. And it's like, yeah, like with this bus, this isn't the end. Like, Hey, if I go on to something else, it's inspiration to really go do more. Like you don't have to stop and just, I completed something like keep going at it. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, even just to take that an another level, you and I got to meet Karen Dark, right? She came on the yeah. episode on uh, a couple of different podcast episodes, but you and I actually traveled to the kingdom of Bhutan with her. 
And yep, that's uh, incredible. I mean, what an unbelievable experience that we had. And um, there's actually a link from that trip back to your bus. Tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, while we were there in Bhutan, um, we got to do a little shopping. And in this little shop, I found a door handle of a dragon. Um, I'll, I'll include a photo, but, you know, it's the land of the thunder dragon. And it was like, I saw it. I was like, this is amazing. Like, you know, there's only one of them. I was like, I don't know how, what the conversion rate is, but I just picked it up and I was like, I'm going to get that. And I'm going to put that in the bus somewhere. I don't know if it's going to go in the kitchen, bedroom, whatever, but I'm going to get it. So uh, yeah, we brought it back and now it's actually on our bathroom door, our, yep. uh, our barn style door. <laughs> it's so cool. The land of the thunder dragon is the door handle to the bathroom on the bus. Yep. It's so Great. amazing. Yeah, it's been awesome. You know, um, I, I've had so much fun as well. And just be, this being the 100th episode, you know, I've been thinking a lot about kind of what um, this podcast has meant to me. And uh, for me, there's like, there's really four things that come up. And um, I think the first is being able to provide a platform for, for people to be able to tell their story. I think, you know, a lot of the stories that have been told, like have been told before, but I think we've also had a lot of people on this podcast that have never told their story before. And, uh, it's been really, really fun to be able to give people that platform and, uh, allow people to share their stories. Um, I think the second thing for me is I just love having conversations. Like I just love having individual conversations with people and hearing their stories, um, so that's been super fun, but like you, I think the third thing is the inspiration that I've gotten and like, just, you know, listening to the people's stories and what they're doing, it makes me want to get out there and do more myself. And I mean, I have like, you know, we went to Bhutan, there's just been like, I've done more camping this year than I have done in my lifetime. And, you know, some's just car camping and some's just like maybe a night here and there, but it's you know, it's just that really that seize the day mentality and, uh, you know, continuing to have these great conversations has been super inspiring. And then the last is being able to share these stories with our listeners. And, uh, you know, I think that one's important as well. Um, so it's, it's a very selfish thing for me, but it also feels good to know that, you know, we're able to share these stories and, and hopefully inspire other people to, to want to get outside. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, I'm curious, Ryan, if like, let's go back to the bus for people that are inspired by your story and the bus. What advice do you have for people that think like, man, that would be really cool to to get a school bus or to get an RV and go explore, explore the, the country? Like what advice would you have for them, especially those that might be thinking like, well, I could never do that? Yeah, uh, I definitely say just go out and do it. Um, you know, if that's visualize what you want that's what i always did so like over the years you know while i was working on that bus like i was visualizing i'm going to be able to use this as a tool to work from the road um to explore more of the country and then i'll go from there so i kind of painted a picture of what the you know the life i wanted to wake up to every day um for at least the next couple of years and that was definitely important uh, another thing if you're you know a thing for me is sometimes worrying about what other people are thinking uh so sometimes it's like I feel like you're living someone's dream, but at the same time, you're living someone's nightmare. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, there's some people who I've told about the bus and they're like, that is so cool. Like, and they have so many questions. Then there's the, I feel like there's the other part where they're like, that's awful. Why would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I always kind of remind myself, like not everyone's going to be on your team and want the same things as you. You know, some people, it terrifies them to go out into the woods. Yeah. It, it's awful. They would hate to live on the, on the road. But then there's the other part. So you always got, if you don't find it in one part, just know there's another part that is all for what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So, all right, Ryan, you've produced 99 episodes. We're getting ready to produce this one. And everybody that comes on this podcast has a couple of questions that they ask at the end. So I know you've had lots of time to prepare for this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm expecting an Oscar on this one. Okay. We'll but, see. You know, Hollywood's going to pick up on your story at some point. They're going to, they're going to hear about the bus. They're going to hear about your adventures and they're going to want to make a movie about this schoolie and Ryan's adventures. And I want to know when they do, who's going to be the Hollywood actor that's going to play you in your movie. Yeah. Uh, had a lot of thoughts on this one and I still have to go with the twofer. Um, I think it'd be Pedro Pascal Ooh. and Ooh. yeah. And Jack Black. So I think it'd be a mix of those two. Uh, maybe, past and present or something along those lines. 
Pedro Pascal, the Mandalorian, baby. Yeah. Or, or Jack Black. I love it. Hey, can I yep. offer a third? Because Go for it. and I don't I'm only doing this with you. I don't ever do this. But when we were okay. in when we were in Bhutan, they, yeah. <laughs> the little young monks at the monastery called you Aquaman Aquaman because they said that you Aquaman, look like Aquaman. Yeah. Jason, Jason Momoa. Momoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was definitely that was yeah. Flattering. Oh, that was so much fun. Okay. What's your movie going to be called? I think it's got to be Seats Taken. Seats Taken. Yes. Seats Taken. I love yep. it. That's uh, that's one of your Instagram channels. Yep. Seats Taken Bus. Seats Taken. Starring Pedro Pascal, Jack Black, or Jason Momoa. There you go. You get to, you get to decide. <laughs> well, listen, I just want to um, thank you so much for all that you've done to help me to spread this message. I think that uh, I think we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to hopefully inspire our listeners to listen to that voice inside that calls them to adventure and, and hopefully inspire them to get outside. Ryan, if people want to learn more about you, your bus or peacekeeper or any of your other ventures, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. Uh, for the bus, uh, Instagram's the best way. We have all our photos and videos on there uh, at seats taken bus. And then for Peacekeeper, it's everything on all the channels. It's at my Peacekeeper, Keeper spelled K-E-Y. Um, also my Peacekeeper.com. Awesome. And we'll make sure to include links to all of that on the show notes so people can log on to the show notes page and grab those things. Um, for those listening, I hope that you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope Ryan's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or just need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thank you for listening. Ryan, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, congrats on episode 100. You too, Scott. That's huge. Thank you. <laughs>